Hello, I'm Rachel Siegel, the Executive Director of the Primavera Fund, and I would like to welcome you to our Sterling Masterclass online series. We've had to go online in response to the COVID-19 crisis, but we're very excited to be able to bring you this content in your homes every single week. So please check back for a new video on a new topic every Thursday at 4, and stay safe. Hello, my name is Andrew Parker, and I'm the Oval Professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm the Principal Oval of the Quad City Symphony. I'm very excited to be here making this video for you and to get to chat with all of you afterwards. Uh, the title of this video is The Art of Performance, Dancing with the Inner Voice. Because of that, I wanted to start this video with a little clip of me performing just so you could see it in action and so that you could kind of get to know me a little bit as a musician. Um, and what I really want to talk to you guys about today is how to perform, how to get up on stage in front of an audience, any size audience in any location, and perform at the level that you are capable of. I know for me that that was a real challenge for many, many years. I struggled a lot with nerves, and I want to be very careful when we talk about nervousness. I want to make sure that we talk about the fact that all nerves are is adrenaline. It's just simply adrenaline that the body is providing to help you perform better. It is actually a beneficial thing. But we have a tendency to build a narrative around that process that is more negative. We view it as something that hinders our ability to perform rather than brings us to new heights. So in order to do that, in order to allow nervousness, let's call it performance excitement, in order to allow that to have the beneficial effect it needs to we need to work on two things in our musical life. We need to work on the quality of our preparation, and we need to work on our inner voice, the nature of our inner voice and the relationship we have with it. Hence why the title of this talk is Dancing with Your Inner Voice. And I specifically use the word dancing because this process, the process of learning how to have a healthy relationship with your inner voice can be a positive, joyous process. It absolutely can be a source of great joy and fulfillment if approached in the right way. And that right way may not be exactly the same from person to person, but there are certainly some fundamental aspects to it that I'm going to talk to you about today. So, of those two branches, I'm going to get to the preparation side of it shortly, but I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the nature of the inner voice and how to start developing it. I'd like to first ask you, what do you think about when you're performing? What goes on in your mind? What goes on in your mind when you're practicing? What goes on in your mind throughout the day? This is something that affects all human beings. I'm sure many of you may have noticed that a lot of times your mind stream tends to be on the negative side. We tend to think about 
how we weren't quite good enough and how we messed that up and how we said the wrong thing at that time and how we missed that note and how we disappointed our teacher or our peer or our colleague that we were performing with. I know that that oftentimes tends to be the way my thoughts want to stream as well. And I used to get up on stage and perform. And the second I'd start playing, my narrative was, oh my gosh, you're not going to get through this. You're, everyone's going to see you fall flat on your face. You're going to mess this up. Immediately, the second I'd start performing, that was where my thoughts were inclined to go. And it used to have a profound effect on me. It would make me tighten up physically and mentally. Anything I could do to just kind of survive, I would go into survival mode. Sometimes it would work out and I would play okay. And other times it would be a complete disaster. I knew that I wanted to be a musician for my life. I knew that this was my calling. So I realized in my late teens and early to mid twenties that I had to figure this out. I had to figure out how to perform consistently and enjoy performing and, and perform at the level I'm capable of if I'm going to be able to sustain this for my life. So I began to read, I began to study, I began to experiment, I began to explore. And what I discovered is that Developing an objective awareness of that inner voice and of the sorts of thoughts you have throughout the day, particularly when you're playing or performing, but in general at all times, is the key. So it's not about whether or not you can get rid of those thoughts. I want you to not even think that. Okay, we're not going to get rid of this voice. We're not going to get rid of these thoughts. By thinking I need to get rid of these, you're making them an enemy, which tends to make them stronger, right? The key is to not get rid of them or indulge in them or do anything with them all at all other than observing them, learning from them, seeing when they rise up, seeing maybe what's at the root of them using them as an entrance point to explore what your fears and insecurities really are and maybe begin to face those fears and insecurities in a loving, non-judgmental way. Now, I know that sounds like a lot. It sounds like a big thing. It's a process that takes time. You're not going to necessarily get all of this in one day or one week or one year or 10 years. This is a lifelong process, but what I can tell you is it's a process that comes with a great deal of fulfillment and a great deal of joy. Absolutely will come with some frustration and will come with challenge and difficulty. In fact, that's part of what makes it so fulfilling. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about preparation. So what I want you to do, what I encourage you to start doing is start becoming aware of any time you have a thought that is self-destructive, that is unkind to yourself or anyone else, really. It's all the same thing. Unkind thoughts to yourself and to other people come from the same place. So next time you think to yourself, oh, God, I really messed that up. I'm not good enough or, oh, I shouldn't enter that competition. There's no way I'm going to be able to do what that person can do. The next thing you have that, I just want you to make note of it. I just want you to notice it. You can say, oh, there's that thought. Huh, interesting. Okay, just notice when it happens. That's all you need to do. Take one second. You can go right back into having those thoughts and doing whatever. It really just takes one moment of objective awareness of that thought to begin to unravel the addiction to those thoughts that we tend to have, right? I want you to start noticing that. So what happened for me is I began that process of paying attention to those thoughts and making note of them and sort of just looking at them with wide-eyed curiosity and nothing else. Just kind of getting to know that. And after time of after a long time of working on this process, those thoughts began to come less and less. When I would get up on stage to perform, they would still come into my mind. 
in a, a situation like that, for me, it would tend to make those sorts of thoughts really rise to the surface. But because I had been developing this objective awareness over time throughout my daily life, in the heat of the performance, I was able to let them pass through me without having as much of an effect on me. And every passing year or two, the effect they would have on me and the quality of my performance would get less and less. Eventually, I was able to use those thoughts and the rising of those thoughts as a springboard to actually allow me to jump more deeply into the art I was making in a performance. So that the rising of those thoughts actually have now become a way that I can use to get myself to go deeper into what I'm doing to surrender to it more, to give more to the audience, to give more to the music. But that it was a process that took me a long time. It's so important that in the course of this, for any of you that are interested in maybe beginning this journey and beginning exploring this, that you do so with no judgment towards yourself, no expectation of results or how long it's going to take for anything to make a difference. The less expectation you have for a specific result, the more you will get from this. It is worth doing simply for the process itself. Everything that comes out of that is icing on the cake. So that is what I call dancing with the inner voice. It's not about completely transforming your thought stream into something that's always positive and always confident. It's not about getting rid of thought entirely at all. It's about developing an objective awareness of the nature of your thoughts so that they can no longer be in control of you. They will still happen, but they are just weather patterns passing through the sky. Remember, you are the sky, not the weather. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to talk to you about the other aspect of learning the art of performance, which is the quality and nature of your daily preparation. And I'm going to be doing a little bit of playing for part of this to demonstrate some ways you can practice and work on this in your everyday work on your instrument. So we've been talking today about developing a mind state and a mind stream that feels healthy when you're performing and when you're not performing as well. And in order for that to happen, the body has to be incorporated into that process. If your body is tight, your mind's going to be tight and vice versa. They have a symbiotic relationship. So as you're working day to day on taking care of the inner voice and developing a healthy relationship, you can also be working on developing a way of playing physically that feels effortless and efficient and smooth and in part of a flow. The thing that I see happen to a lot of students is they, they get introduced to this idea and then they think, okay, I just need to understand this in the right way. I just need to grasp this concept and once I do, everything will get better. It's not quite that simple. It's a practice. It's a daily practice, just like learning your pieces, learning your notes. You have to build this into your play brick by brick, and it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of mindfulness, it takes a lot of care, but it is well worth it, as I can attest to, because I wasn't able to perform consistently at any level that was remotely resembling what my potential was. And in order for me to have the kind of career I wanted, I had to figure out how to do that. And this daily work, daily work on my mind and daily work on the physicality of play allowed me to do that. So that when I did feel that excitement and that energy and that adrenaline that we so often interpret as nervousness when it was time to perform, I was able to channel that. I was able to allow it to become a source of me going deeper into the music. And it's a work in progress, and it's not always a straight line. I'll go for months where I have performances where I feel completely in a flow and completely 
able to do what it is that I hear in my imagination, what it is I work toward every day in my practicing. And then all of a sudden I'll have a performance where I get tight again and where I'm fighting the process and fighting the flow. So then I have to say to myself, okay, there's more work to be done here. Thank you. This is good. This is, I feel gratitude when I realize the work is never done because that's what makes this engaging and interesting for a lifetime. If it were easy and if you were able to figure out what you need to do and never have another problem, then you would get bored with it. So remember first and foremost to express some sort of thankfulness for the challenge of this art form. It's a huge part of what makes it such a worthwhile art form. Absolutely. Now, it's all right to feel frustrated at, at times. It's all right to get upset. It, that's normal. That's human. That's part of the process. But then you pick yourself up and you say, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that the next time I get up to perform or take an audition or do a competition or even just practice and have it feel good and have it feel connected, have it feel like a flow, and analyze that and look at that and study that and experiment and try different things, try practicing in different ways. Watch videos, study great teachers on YouTube or other resources, watch their master classes, watch other people play, study how they use their bodies, study what it looks like is going on when they perform, and see if you can figure out how to incorporate that or aspects of that into your own work and into your own practice. So what I'd like to do now with that in mind is just show you the tip of the iceberg of some of the things you can do in your practicing and in your daily work on your fundamentals. And when I say fundamentals, I'm referring to the foundation of your playing your tone production, your body placement, your voicing, how you create a singing tone when you play. That's what I mean by fundamentals. A lot of times I feel like when we say the word fundamental, students sometimes think we're talking about this. And that is a part of it, absolutely. The fingers dancing across the keys is absolutely an essential aspect of your tone production. But the tone starts in your imagination and then it goes through your support system and then is issued through the instrument and out into the world. So it's a full mind, body, soul experience. And in your practicing, you can learn how to make this feel as effortless as possible. Even if you don't know what to do or how to do it, just by imagining it and experimenting and exploring, you can start to chip away at this and start to sculpt a system of playing that is going to be something you can rely on in performance. So I'm going to utilize a scale today to show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. So I oftentimes like to start my practice sessions with scales. I'll start with maybe a slow scale just to work on the connectivity of my body to my instrument, the flow of my wind, the placement of my support, the fluidity and the rest of my body. And I'll start just with a slow scale and establish that beautiful legato sound. <laughs> Okay, and while I'm playing, I'm doing two things. I'm absolutely trying to create a mood, trying to play something poetically, something singing, something that has a soulful dimension to it. But I'm also, at the same time, really analyzing in a very scientific way what's going on, what's going on in my body, what's going on with my breath, what's going on with my fingers, what's going on with my voicing apparatus, embouchure, oral cavity, face, all of this. 
what it's feeling like, and I'm trying to pay attention to any bits of tension or instability that I may be feeling. And in doing that, I'm then trying to open up any place that I'm feeling tension build up. The way I used to play a lot was more like this. Everything was up, everything was tight. I believed I had to make, I had to bring the control right here, right where the embouchure and the reed meet, because that's where it felt like the sound was happening, right? And I needed to establish control and that is a falsehood, right? The control, the root of our playing, I like the word root better than control, happens in a much deeper place in the body, in a much more central place. It really happens in the core. Of course, everything above the core is part of the process for sure. And the embouchure does need to be engaged. But the key is to transfer as much of the root of the strength of your playing to the center of your body as possible so that everything happening up here can absolutely be as free and efficient as the equipment will allow. And the freer it is, the better things are going to be for you. The longer you'll be able to play, the more you'll be able to surrender to the flow of the music and the easier things will become. So. How do we go from this way of playing to something else? Well, awareness is step one. Absolutely. Awareness is key. A lot of times I notice students haven't even begun to think about this. They haven't even really started paying attention to what their body's doing when they're playing. So awareness is number one. Second thing to do is to learn how to breathe. Now, for those of you who don't play a wind instrument or don't sing, this may be a little bit different. This may not be a direct translation for you, but I have no doubt that a lot of these things will apply nonetheless. String players, pianists, percussionists, all of you do need to be extraordinarily aware of your body and your breath, of course. It just doesn't necessarily have such a direct relationship to the creation of the sound like it does on a wind instrument. So us, we wind players have to learn how to breathe and have to learn how to support properly while we're playing, right? So a lot of times we breathe like this. This is how many of us kind of move through the world, breathing up here and playing like that. So first things first, you need to learn how to allow the breath to travel lower into your body. So you can expand down here in the region of the core. This is something that singers talk about a lot. Rib cage expansion, expanding in the back, expanding out here. So working on how to breathe that way. One way I like to do that is to practice breathing with my hand on my abdomen like this. And I'll take a slow breath in. And then I'll blow out. and continue feeling that expansion. So I know that when I play the oboe, I'm gonna be able to maintain the position of the breath so that the upper body can stay as free and fluid and expansive as possible. That's absolutely part of this process and a very important one. Another thing is making sure that you don't allow tension to build up when you play. Now I understand that when we play, we are engaging muscles. They can't be completely limp and completely loose. They can't be just flopping around. There has to be poise. I like to think of it as the tautness of a ballet dancer, right? There's strength and there's engagement, but there's also flexibility and fluidity in there. So that's what we're looking for in the body. And one of the ways I really have found it easy to find or begin finding is by moving when I play. Seems very basic, right? And I know a lot of teachers out there have various opinions about moving when you play. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. You can be still and still be absolutely fluid. And you can move around a lot and still have unnecessary tension. So 
That's not exactly what I'm talking about here. That's something for you to figure out through your own practice. But I do know that by moving a bit while you're playing, you know, particularly moving in a way that has some sort of control to it, so not wildly moving around a ton, but just a little bit of shifting and rocking, maybe bending the knees a little bit, really helps me prevent myself from tightening unnecessarily anywhere. You can't be tight if you're in motion. You can't be as tight if you're in motion. And you can become very aware of where there might be tightness. So let's take that scale. We'll go back to the scale. I was just doing a C major scale. And maybe for those of us who are kind of in the earlier stages of discovering this aspect of being a musician, then maybe don't even worry about a complete scale yet. You could just start with five notes up and down. Let's try that. We're going to go down from C to G and back down to C. And all we're going to focus on is keeping the body feeling really fluid, not letting unnecessary tightness build up, being aware of where our breath is, being aware of how we're moving our fingers across the keys and trying to sort of emulate the physical landscape of a ballet dancer. Okay, now one thing that I think is extremely important in this process is that you do not let yourself get into a mechanical mind state, even though you may be just playing five notes up and down and you may be concentrating on your body, but that you make sure that you play whatever you're playing, whether it's one note or a concerto, as beautifully and poetically as you possibly can. Remember, you're building habits into your mind and body when you play. Make it a habit to play beautifully. Make it an absolutely intrinsic flavor of your play. And the only way to do that is to make sure that that's always how you play. Never go into a mechanical state where you go... I may have been relatively free when I did that. I may not have had a lot of tightness, but it was also not particularly beautiful. It was not particularly smooth. It was not particularly profound. So do both. Be aware of the mechanics of your playing and making them as refined and efficient and smooth as possible while also making sure that you are pouring beauty and meaning into everything you're doing. And then from there, perhaps you could expand the scale and start traveling a little bit further. As we know as oboe players, when we start going into the more extreme registers, that's when things can sometimes get a little bit more complex. And I assume it's probably similar to other instruments. So as we get higher and higher, we might notice I'm starting to get a little tighter here. I'm starting to, as I go into the high register, I'm starting to develop some tension in the body while I'm playing. So that's when you have to really then expand your awareness, pay very close attention to what's going on, and recognize whatever stories or narratives are at the root of that. For example, it's harder to play in the high register. I hear that all the time from students. Okay, it's harder. The high register is hard. Now, how much of that is actually true, and how much of that is a self-fulfilling prophecy? Right? By believing it to be true and speaking it to ourselves and others, it becomes our reality. So let go of that. Be fresh. Every time you practice, be fresh. Don't bring baggage into it. Right? Maybe the high register isn't that hard if you're focusing your air in the right way, which really doesn't take much work. But you have to find how to do it, and you have to build in a way of achieving that that is as effortless as possible. Okay, 
So I felt as I went into the high register that I wanted to start to reach for it a little bit, right? I wanted to start to tighten a little bit, and I conscientiously made my energy and my support move down. I felt my connection to the earth. I felt like I was drawing energy from the earth underneath my feet to keep me grounded, to keep my energy nice and low and anchored and stable. So then you might want to spend some time just up there in the high register. try the different dynamics, you want to try different articulations, you want to make sure you're changing your key areas, right? Just for today, we're sticking around in C major for the sake of this demonstration, but you want to make sure you don't ever get stuck in any ruts in your playing. Always make sure to change something. It can be something small, but you have to keep on developing all the aspects of your playing. So if you're only ever practicing in one key area, well, then your other key areas are not going to shine as much. So then maybe we go to minor. And I like to make up little melodies in, in this process. I like to make sure that not only am I developing this way of playing that is more effortless, but that I'm also constantly engaging the creative part of my music making by improvising melodies. There is an aspect of performance that feels improvisatory. If for no other reason, then it's hard to recreate the exact scenario of a performance without the performance. Yes, going out and playing for your friends and going to nursing homes and going to hospitals and making recordings, all of those things are extremely useful to help you developing the art of performance. That being said, getting up on stage in front of an orchestra, for example, in front of a large audience in a large hall is a very unique situation. So there's going to be an aspect of it, no matter how much you prepare the music and prepare your playing every day, that's going to be a little bit unpredictable. And as such, I think it is important to tap into the improvisatory, spontaneous side of your playing regularly in your practicing so that we don't get stuck being completely dependent on knowing exactly what's going to happen. Being extraordinarily prepared is essential but being open-minded enough and flexible enough to deal with unforeseen circumstances is also integral to your consistency and success as a performer. As I conclude this video, I wanted to first say thank you all for letting me come speak to you today. This has been a real treat, and I hope you've got a lot of questions for, for me. Feel free to ask anything about this video or music or life in general. And before I sign off, I just want to say that anybody from any background can learn how to perform at a high level with consistency and in a way that is fulfilling and enjoyable. And it takes, it can take a lot of work. Some people have a knack for it from the beginning. Some people have to work really hard on it like I did. But I encourage all of you to enter this process, whatever it may be for you, with great joy and great curiosity and a sense of adventure. And the path looks different for each individual. And all of us are going to come across hurdles and pitfalls in this path. And just remind yourself that those are the biggest opportunities for learning and growth that you can possibly have in your journey as a Performing artist. So I wish you all the best luck in the world, and I look forward to seeing what the future has in store for you. Thank you.